Hello, and welcome to this Updates in Thrombosis Management, a focus on the emerging role of Factor 11 inhibition, sponsored by Medscape and theheart.org. My name is Jeffrey Barnes. I'm a cardiologist and vascular medicine specialist at the University of Michigan, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by my good friend, Dr. Manesh Patel from Duke University. Manesh, thanks for being here with us today. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, excited to be here, and it should be a good time. You know, I had so much fun when we were together at the ACC meeting. We had that great uh, game show event, uh, really successful. And I actually think it was your team, the defibrillators, that ended up winning that event, which was uh, really nice to see. Yeah, always, always great to be part of a live game show where your team comes from behind to get some thrombosis questions. <laughs> it's uh, the height of game show fun. Yeah, it was, it was fun to have that live audience and, and that virtual audience all coming together. And, you know, I thought what we could do today is maybe review a few of those highlight points that, that came up during that session. And so, you know, maybe I'll get started with one. As we think about thrombosis risk, how do you think about a patient's sort of lifetime risk of thrombosis and some of the most common conditions that, that put them at risk for thrombotic events? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. You know, I uh, I think about a hierarchy of not just how we take care of patients with thrombotic issues, but their risk. And on the slide here, people can ho hopefully see that I sort of think about the not only the the prevalence of things that people might experience throughout their life, but also as as clinicians when we're taking care of them, which of these conditions should I sort of be prioritizing as I think about my therapy? So at the at the top of this pyramid, you see chronic um, atrial fibrillation, and and so the risk of of stroke or systemic embolism from atrial fibrillation significant in the and the lifetime risk of getting atrial fibrillation um, for someone at least the best we know today and the population as it ages will probably even have a higher lifetime risk but it's somewhere between 21 to 36 percent and and it's higher in in white male individuals and and as you know if you have atrial fibrillation and it's untreated chronically that increases your risk for a lifetime risk of stroke four to five fold. Uh, and so, you know, one first sort of message from this conversation that we had in person was also that this, this is not a something we think about just for our patients. Unfortunately, up to 20% of people in, in the audience or more might have a lifetime risk of atrial mm -hmm. fibrillation. The ne next sort of in the middle there is um, the lifetime or at least the risk of of acute and chronic venous thromboembolism. I know something you think a lot about, and I sort of yeah. put into context for people to think about, you know, about one in 12 middle-aged adults. So there's sort of like a, not only the lifetime risk, but when do you have something happen, right? So atrial fibrillation yeah. might be at the top of this pyramid, and it may be one of the conditions that I'll at least say predominantly is a little bit older. It's not middle-aged. Mm -hmm. The middle one is a little bit more middle-aged, but can go on into older too. And one in 12 middle-aged people uh, 45 years or older, and that's about 8% getting a, a VTE and, a, and, and unfortunately higher in you know, obese and African-American or black individuals. And at the bottom is our, I'll call it acute, acute and chronic thromboembolic, or I'm sorry, atherosclerotic disease. And so that's CAD and PAD. And so our lifetime risk of MI, which is unfortunately a, a still real issue, anyone over 20 is, is about 3%. And then lifetime risk of getting atherosclerosis in your lower extremity that eventually gets identified. And at least I'll just say the ways to identify is starting to change. The PAD guidelines from the AHA, ACC were out just a, a day or two ago. And again, highlight for peripheral arterial disease that we should be looking for people who have symptoms of leg claudication, but also some of these risk factors. And that's about 19 to 30% again in there. Those are again, Hispanic individuals or black individuals might be the highest risk. So as I think about this bottom to top, those would be the kinds of risks that I think people should should be thinking about. And I guess, Jeff, you know, um, these are important sort of conditions, but um, a lot of people say, well, yeah, Manesh, you just talked us through the risk and the things we could use to treat these individuals. And I hear this all the time. We, you know, uh, we have so many therapies that work. Do we really need new agents or new anticoagulants? Because, you know, part of what we were talking about at this live show was new antithrombotic uh, therapy. So do we really need new things? Yeah, I get that same question a lot. And, and I think it's always helpful to step back and say, where have we come from as we think about where we may be going? And, you know, I know this can be triggering for some people, this sort of view of the coagulation cascade, but I bring it up really just to highlight that all of our currently available anticoagulants, whether you're talking about the parenteral things, right, like heparin and the low molecular weight heparins, or, or what we had for decades, which were those vitamin K antagonists, 
um, as well as the sort of evolution we had about a decade ago with our direct thrombin inhibitor, dabigatran, and then those factor 10A inhibitors that we, we use a lot these days, right? Apixaban, rivaroxaban, adoxaban. You know, they all sort of concentrate down on this common part of the coagulation cascade, which is really effective when we think about preventing thrombosis. And, you know, if I think about just one example, which is stroke prevention in AFib, you talked about that at the top of that pyramid you showed. When we got the, the direct oral anticoagulants, those direct thrombin inhibitors and factor 10A inhibitors, the big advance here was that we were really able to show great efficacy in preventing stroke and systemic embolism, but we also reduced the most feared bleeding complication, which was that hemorrhagic stroke, right? And, and we see that represented on the left side of the slide. And, and with that, we saw some improvements in mortality, you know, overall at a class level. But I think the sort of the unmet need piece or the, the, the opportunity to sort of continue to evolve really is on the right-hand side where we still see problems with extracranial bleeding. You know, I think about my patients who have those significant GI bleeds. I think about my patients who have those very clinically relevant or what sometimes are called, you know, nuisance bleeds like nose bleeds. Um, certainly we see them in the, the GU tract, you know, hematuria and other things like that. And so if there's an opportunity for us to continue to find efficacy at preventing thrombosis, but further reduce that risk of bleeding, then we can really open these therapies up for even more patients and make them safer. So that's where I think there's a, a real opportunity. Yeah, that's great. And great description. And we're getting lots of great questions from the audience. And so I might bring a few of those forward. Sure. Uh, one, I'll answer a few and ask a few. You know, one, somebody asked in the last section, you know, is the upper arm DVT the same as lower extremity? I actually think the instance is a little lower than the lower extremity, and there's probably unusual mm -hmm. situations that leads to that. Another question somebody said really specific to this is said, you know, for patients with atrial fibrillation, they see uh, uh, unmet need, but is that under treatment by prescribers or patients' unwillingness to take the DOAX? And why, why do we see not enough of the patients getting these therapies that work? Yeah, I mean, I think the answer here is that there's not one answer. There's a multitude of factors that kind of play in. Um, clearly, under-prescribing is a major issue. And, and, and this slide nicely summarizes a lot of it. If I look at the left side, this was some data from a very large registry and, and really shows that for patients who are eligible for anticoagulation therapy, right, they're at increased risk of stroke, we see that only about two thirds of them are actually receiving that stroke prevention therapy with an oral anticoagulant. So there is that clear gap that, that we still are under treating those, those folks. And, and you know, you look at why, what are some of the different reasons? Uh, when, when you do chart reviews, when you dig into it, sometimes the patient refuses, right? And they have a right to do that, but sometimes they may not know fully about the risks and benefits. Other times clinicians might say, gosh, that AFib burden's so low, or, um, hey, I've successfully treated their AFib, they don't need it. And I think that, you know, there's still some controversy as to whether that's really the case. But a lot of times we as clinicians are the barrier, right? We, we perceive somebody to be at risk of fall or risk of bleed. And we say, well, I'm not gonna uh, give that person a medication that I'm worried about the harm piece but maybe I'm also not fully considering what the benefit is there. And, and, and that's, that's really critical. But it's not just us. I mean, patients also will stop their anticoagulants. You know, if you go to the far right of the screen, when they surveyed about 3,000 or more patients, many of them considered either pausing or stopping their anticoagulant, especially if they experienced some sort of bleeding or bruising, and they didn't always tell their healthcare provider. So we don't always know about it. And that's another real challenge and, and I think an opportunity for us to improve care. And, and if you ask patients, especially those who are not being treated, many of them, more than half will say, yeah, I'm willing to consider an anticoagulant once I learn about the, the risks of thrombosis and some of the safety concerns around bleeding and, and really try and make that best decision for myself. So, so I think there's a lot of room for us to improve here. For sure, yeah. So I want to ask you a question now. Um, as we think a little bit about the physiology, help me understand a little bit about what happens when people develop clots and, and are all clots the same or are there different types of clots that you think about? Yeah, you know, I'll, I'll keep it simple because I think it's hard for us to go through the coagulation cascade again. But I think on this slide, people will think about, you know, I often say 
you know, people talk about good clots and bad clots. And so I, I, I'll use the terms that we learned in medical school or others. That there's hemostasis, clotting to prevent bleeding. And then there's thrombosis, clotting that can be pathologic. And so if you look on this slide, you gave us the nice sort of coagulation cascade. Mm -hmm. And that usually means that when there's an interruption in the blood vessel or tissue, we have a, a tissue factor driven pathway that gets us to actually develop thrombin to stop ourselves from bleeding. That's a that's a biologic process that we've evolved over years to prevent us from having bad problems because of some sort of a cut, all kinds of things like that. If that goes out of control, there's amplification and you can see downstream that can then lead to an actual thrombosis and that can be pathologic thrombosis. So in, in trying to keep it pretty simple, I usually just tell people, you know, there, there is a hemostasis and thrombosis and that delicate balance when it goes out of, uh, I'll say out of whack is when we get to those kinds of issues. And I guess, you know, thinking about this, as you see on the slide, there's a 10A inhibitor or DOAX or th direct thrombin inhibitors or actual 10A inhibitors. You can see that when they inhibit 10A there, they prevent that 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 actual thrombosis that, that can also lead to that thrombosis downstream, but can lead to bleeding. And so that balance, of course, is something we're always balancing. And it's with these great agents, some people would say, do we really need new? How are these emerging factor 11 inhibitors different from DOAX? And maybe I'll put that back to you, Jeff, to say, how does that work? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of key things, and I'm just going to hit a few of them. First is that there's real differences in the structures, right? Some of them are small molecules. Some of them are antisense oligonucleotides. Others are monoclonal antibodies. Um, some are oral, but some are IV and sub-Q, which means we may take some of them once or twice a day, but others may only be treated once a week or once a month. And interestingly, most of the ones being tested right now have little to no renal uh, elimination. So I think there's going to be some real differences that we see compared to, to our current agents. And so as we think about that, uh, Manish, like, what are you really hoping? Like, what are we thinking we can achieve by doing this factor 11 or 11A inhibition? Yeah. So if we go back to this slide that we were showing before, you know, as you can see on this slide, the hope is that if you move just a little downstream between this hemostasis and thrombosis, again, this is hypothetical, our hope of what we'll do physiologically, is that you'll still allow there to be some thrombin generated to stop bleeding, but that the factor 11 or 11A inhibitors actually can potentially inhibit that contact initiated pathway of thrombin amplification so that you don't get the downstream big thrombus that leads to issues. So the, the idea is that you would uncouple potentially hmm. hemostasis, a little bit of clot that's got a bad clot that might lead to those clinical events. Uh, simplifying it, but that's the hope. So, so I think hypothetically, that sounds really nice, right? Is there actual data to support that this may be a reality? Yeah. So, you know, there is, and these are, this is a, a whole set of, of phase two studies mm -hmm. with factor 11 and 11A inhibition, uh, many of which are published. Uh, the one on the far right, Azalea, has been presented at the American Heart Association. Hopefully it'll be published soon. But I think these are really reassuring. And uh, there's different molecules, different agents here, but I'll just briefly spend a moment on them. So the studies on the left are axiomatic and then the anti-005 TKA studies. Uh, that's milvexian, which is a, a small molecule, factor uh, 11 in inhibitor. And that, and that small molecule has shown, again, some reduction at similar rates of bleeding with no real dose relationship. And, and you could find some doses that bled less than anoxaparin mm -hmm. and then some less clot than anoxaparin in the TKR study. So that's really valuable. Um, and the same kind of thing with antibodies there. You can see this uh, abilisumab is, a, mm -hmm. is an actual antibody, antibody to factor 11 that prevents it from getting activated. So that's, a, that's an important antibody potentially there too. Uh, Pacific stroke is a small molecule called asyndexian that was compared against placebo and it didn't see huge amounts of bleeding and saw some of the stroke types potentially in a post hoc analysis or better. And then really interesting on the far right is azalea TIMI-71, which is a, the abilisumab antibody again in, in about 1,200 patients with atrial fibrillation. There, their comparator was rivaroxaban, one of the DOACs, and oh. showed significantly less bleeding compared to rivaroxaban. In fact, almost reduction in all GI bleeding compared to rivaroxaban. So a, a really interesting and important signal. However, of course, we got to do those larger phase three studies to see if they actually lead to less stroke. And, and if you go to the next slide here, you'll see that these phase two studies have been going on for quite some time. Uh, you know, they're, importantly, you can see over now almost 10 years they've been going on and some of these studies have sort of shown us key findings that they're effective at preventing vte and tka there's less or similar rates of, of bleeding versus anoxaparin no increase in bleeding against placebo with mi 
AFib you saw at least in a few phase two studies less bleeding than DOAC in it. And then again, after stroke, no increase in bleeding potentially compared to placebo, but we'll have to see about efficacy. You know, this this timeline that you're showing uh, really feels similar to me to the development phase we had before the DOAX came to market, right? There were several years of those phase one, phase two studies. And, and I'm wondering, we're now entering into that phase three portion of studying these factor 11 and 11A inhibitors. And I know you've been involved in, in some of the studies and all. Can you help us understand where are we at? What's the current landscape of these ongoing phase three studies? Yeah, it's really important. And this, this is a list of at least some of the phase three studies that are on clinicaltrials.gov that are at least uh, contemplated or ongoing. And you can see mm -hmm. abolizumab is that antibody, asyndexin is a small molecule, milvexin is another small molecule. And across, you can see atrial fibrillation studies, both people with getting a, a placebo or a, against a DOAC. Um, so that's important. You can see that. You can also see VTE. And, and, and you even see secondary stroke and AMI. So a broad set of indications. One of these, uh, Oceanic AF, was stopped early for lack of efficacy compared to apixaban. And I think that's important for us to see because we're going to learn from it. And as you said, these studies take sometimes years to do. It took us 15, 20 years or more to beat warfarin. And so other studies in atrial fibrillation are still happening. Other studies in these indications are happening. And I think this is just the first chapter of a story that's still being written. And uh, these other studies are being monitored by DSMB. And I think that means that they're safe, if not, again, showing us that there might be efficacy. So, you know, I'm still fairly um, hopeful here based on what we've seen. In fact, I'm quite excited about the field because I do think it's complicated. The right patient, the right population, if you will, the comparator, the right indication. We're studying a lot of those. Um, so that's my excitement. But I didn't know if you had any other um, thoughts as a concluding thoughts, um, you know, Jeff, about the space or the excitement you might have in this area. Well, I think one of the things that's really exciting is that we're not just looking at sort of the areas where we've traditionally used anticoagulants, meaning stroke prevention in AFib and the treatment or prevention of VTE, but we're also expanding this a little bit. And you can see on this list of ongoing studies are some other indications like secondary stroke prevention and even the treatment of patients who have a recent acute coronary syndrome. And, and it's I think it's because we're tapping into this this hypothetical um, potential that we could get reductions in thrombosis without necessarily having increases in bleeding. And for those two populations in particular, I think that's really important, right? Either because we're already using other thrombotic agents, you know, in the, the ACS population, there's a lot of antiplatelet therapy we use, or in the secondary stroke prevention space where we really have to worry about the consequences of bleeding. So to me, it's exciting that we're also expanding the, the different populations of patients that we're testing to see where there may or may not be benefits. So uh, I'm really excited about that phase of, of these current studies and, and the potential for factor 11 inhibition as we go forward. Well, I think so too. I think there's gonna be quite an opportunity, hopefully. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. This has been really fun to kind of come back together after the ACC meeting, you know, hit on a couple of these points and really talk about them. I know there's going to be a lot more to come in this field. I want to thank everyone who's joining us online for participating. And if you go ahead and scan that QR code, you can actually get credit for uh, participating in this, this live link. Uh, Manesh, thanks for being with me today. This was a lot of fun and I look forward to more chats in the future. Yeah, really great. Thanks. It was a lot of fun and thank you all for watching.